Uh, welcome everyone to our February monthly program. Um, if you're new, uh, my name is Brian Zink. I'm the executive director for Pilchuck Audubon. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we get to our speaker for the evening. Um, coming up on February 16th through the 19th is the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, it's a really easy way to, to help contribute to uh, conservation and science. Um, you just have to count birds um, in your backyard or really anywhere uh, for just 15 minutes at some point during those four days. That's President's Day weekend. Um, I'll put a link for the for that in the chat if you're interested in learning more about it. Um, yeah, just a really great way if you're new to birding um, to, to start out with some easy birds in your backyard. Also coming up on February 24th is the Stanwood Snow Goose Festival. Uh, this is the first time they've had it since before the pandemic. Um, so really excited to have that back again this year. Um, we will be there at the table, so come say hi. Um, I'll be there for half the day, so come see me and, and some of the other vendors there. Uh, it should be a fun time. And of course, you can go see the snow geese. And then um, we have a class starting later this month um, called All About Owls, and it'll feature all 15 owls that are found in Washington State. Uh, it's a three-week class and um, taught by Connie Seidels, and she's a fantastic instructor. So I encourage you uh, to register for that class. And um, if you can't make it, we, we do record those, and so you can still register and watch the recordings. Uh, that's all I have for quick announcements tonight, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for the evening, C.K. Item. He's a regional biologist with Dutch Unlimited, and he's going to talk about some of the some of the work they do. So, C.K., uh, feel free to take it away. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is C.K. Item. I'm the regional biologist for Dutch Unlimited. I cover the west side of Washington, so from the Cascades to the coast and from the Columbia to Canada. Um, I am recycling a presentation I did a couple years ago for a bunch of non-birders, um, the Sustainable Land Strategy, which is a farm fish flood organization um, in Snoqualmish County that's centered on projects that benefit agriculture, salmon, and uh, flood protection. And the reason I put this presentation together was really to give them an introduction to basic bird conservation, uh, what Ducks Unlimited is doing, and um, Kind of introduce some of the project types that we do in Western Washington. And so feel free to stop me with questions. Um, and then we'll have a lot of time at the end to, to talk. So if I'm going too fast, let me know. If I'm going too slow, let me know. Um, this presentation I first gave, it was about 40 minutes and then it was almost a half an hour of questions. So so Ducks Unlimited is uh, conserves, restores, and manages wetlands across the whole continent. Uh, we were founded just around the Dust Bowl from some uh, duck hunters that were realizing they were seeing less ducks and they wanted to make more. So they realized that they needed to get conservation on the ground. Um, it was in the Midwest and they that most of our projects until the 80s were in Canada, really focused on on um, rearing habitat. Um, so in fiscal year uh, 2021, we conserved, which means all kinds of different things. It, it can mean buying land to, to held it, uh, hold it and protect it. It can mean doing projects, but we conserved uh, 565,000 acres of habitat. In 21, we had um, 600,000 members, a whole bunch of volunteers, and we did we do events all across the country that are uh, dinners where we raise money for waterfowl, and that's really the seed money for folks like me. Um, biologists on the ground, we usually send out a bio and an engineer, and those teams are how we deliver conservation across the, the country. We're also a really big land trust. And the Pacific Coast is a level two priority area for Ducks Unlimited. That means it's a migration corridor. Um, we have sister organizations in Canada and Mexico. So we're Ducks Inc. There's DU Canada and DU Mexico as well. So the agenda for this talk will be basic duck 
Uh, it's probably, you guys probably could do this better than me. Um, waterfowl needs, we're going to be talking a little bit about what they're doing here in Washington, um, how waterfowl conservation is planned, and then one of the tools for waterfowl conservation is the North American Wetland Conservation Act. Uh, we'll talk about that specifically, so NACA, and then I will talk about one specific project, which is the Snoqualmie Springs project down here in Carnage. So Washington's waterfowl are comprised of 27 species of ducks, six species of geese, and two species of swimmers. We have dabblers, which are the most common ducks. When you think duck, that's probably what you're thinking. So mallards and widgeon and pintail and teal. We have 11 species of sea ducks in the winter. Um, and it's pretty amazing uh, to just get on the ferry and see all kinds of birds. Um, we have the presence of all five of the diving ducks during the winter as well. So that's pretty cool. This is uh, the annual cycle of a mallard. And where we really come into our own is the you know, autumnal migration and the vernal migration. So when the birds are moving from where they're rearing to where they're wintering, um, that's when we're feeding them. Some birds end up staying here. We have a lot of resident birds, but Ducks Unlimited and most of the waterfowl conservation are really concentrated on the migratory uh, birds and, and keeping the migration corridors open, keeping the continental population. So this is how we think of the country. So the red is the breeding grounds, the green are the wintering grounds, and the yellow are the areas in between where they're migrating. And so, of course, there's um, wintering birds in Washington and Oregon and the scab lands in eastern Washington, but the vast majority of the birds come through here and eat and then go to one of the green areas. And primarily for us, it's the Central Valley. So these are, this is a priority one for Ducks Unlimited. This is a priority one for Ducks Unlimited. And the yellow is all the priority two. And then we have some kind of gold color and that's, uh, that's priority three. So it's, we still think about that, but it's uh, less, it's a hierarchy. So for most of history, uh, Ducks Unlimited has con been concentrating our, our efforts in the Canadian prairie potholes. So the red area uh, north of the Dakotas. That's the duck factory. So this is what that area looks like from the air. So lots of little ponds threatened by agriculture usually um, that produce a, a vast amount of birds for the continent. Um, in Washington, we get a lot of birds from Alaska and British Columbia and the boreal but for most of the continent, it's the uh, prairie poplars that are, that are doing a lot of the work for the uh, waterfowl. And then they go and they hang out in places like California or the Gulf. Um, and there's large concentrations of food there and large concentrations of birds. And this is where they spend their So what do they want with us here in Washington? Mostly food, and we've already kind of talked about that. So we're really fueling the flight. Ducks eat plants, fish, insects, grains, um, biofilm, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they're very opportunistic. Each species has a little bit different mix of what they're eating. But um, in general, we're trying to provide carbohydrates for the flight south. So things that uh, any kind of seed source is really, really important for the birds heading south. And then when they're heading north, we're really trying to help them make eggs. So proteins are more important. So insects um, are really vital on the north leg. So they'll eat all this stuff both directions, but if you're gonna make me pick, I'd say they want calories south and on the way north, they want more complex nutrients. 
So where do you find that in Washington? Um, you find it in all kinds of natural wetlands. Uh, so bay fronts and beaver ponds and um, spruce swamps and freshwater wetlands. But you also find it in farm fields and farm fields uh, act as proxy freshwater wetlands. They have a lot of the same um, fun uh, habitat functions as early successional wetland habitat. Uh, so they're, they're plants with lots of seeds. There's places, there's places for the birds to get access to invertebrates. Um, they're relatively safe predators. They're usually open um, and they look different. So in the growing season, they'll look like a farm field in the winter. They'll look kind of like a swamp. And so um, we really rely on farmland and natural wetlands for our bird population. And where those two things are in close proximity, like the Skagit or the Still Guamish or Grays Harbor, um, that's where you see the biggest concentrations of birds. So Ducks Unlimited in general, the two things that we've been told that we need to do to make sure there's migratory waterfowl habitat is restore wetlands. We've lost 80, sometimes 90%, depending on the kind of wetland um, of native wetlands in Puget Sound, and then farm preservation. So a lot of those farms are where those wetlands used to be, but keeping farms operating and farmers farming is one of the best things we can do for migratory waterfowl. Uh, the nice thing about a lot of the native wetlands, especially the tidal wetlands, is they're drought proof. Yeah, you don't run out of water in a salt marsh. Um, and the nice thing about farms is they're always, they always have that disturbance cycle that keeps them in very early successional habitat. So you don't have to worry about alders or rank green canary grass. You've got kind of the right conditions for the kinds of foods that don't sell. So how do we manage or plan as, as, as organizations and as entities across the continent? It's divided up into all kinds of management zones. Uh, we have uh, this the center map here is the flyway map. So that's generally how bird conservationists divide the continent up. And then if you look over here on the on the left, these are joint ventures. Those are um, organizations that are in, charged with planning bird habitat um, and bird population and making making all sorts of different decisions and plans and trying to coordinate how those things happen. And, and you can see that they don't quite line up with the flyways. Um, we are, we're in the Pacific Birds Habitat Joint Venture, which also covers Midway Atoll up in Alaska. Um, but it's primarily um, that light kind of bluish green here. So Cascadia and then out into Pacific. Hawaii is part of our joint venture. So that's fun for them. Um, we also have uh, plans that are written by different entities and groups, like Partners in Flight, which are looking at land bird conservation. We have the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, Shorebird Conservation Plan, and then we break those down into smaller plans that address each part of the coast. And right now, the joint venture, Pacific Habitat Birds Joint Venture, is rewriting their plan. Ducks Unlimited is rewriting our plan, but the national plans really haven't changed. And so one of those plans talks about the, well, it's the North American Waterfowl Management Plan. They have specific goals for different geographies. So the percentage of NAWAMP, that's the way we say it, NAWAMP goals for different parts of the region. Um, you can see the Oregon coast is supposed to have 8% of the dabblers, and Puget Sound is supposed to have 31%. The Willamette Valley is supposed to have 22%, and then Lower Columbia, including Willapa and Grays Harbor, uh, is supposed to have a 39 or 40%. And so that works out to 2.4 million, 2 million ducks, um, and our share is about 700. 
44,000. How does all this get funded? Lots of different ways. One of the ways that organizations can help is with duck stamps. I don't know if anybody saw John Oliver do this really great breakdown of duck stamps and how those happen. But it was cool. Um, so anytime anyone buys ammunition for guns, there's some money that goes into conservation. When you get a hunting license or buy a migratory bird stamp, even if you don't hunt, that goes into conservation. And then there's lots of local and state programs that are dedicated for conservation as well. One of those programs is called the North American Wetland Conservation Act that uh, was passed in about 1990. And we've been bringing not just Ducks Unlimited, but Department of uh, Fish and Wildlife. Um, I know the, I think, uh, hold on. The Skagit Land Trust has also gotten a small NACA. Um, some of the other land trusts have, have pulled these in, but uh, this program funds wetland conservation aimed at bird habitat. And the ones that I know that Ducks Unlimited has been participating in, these are just the names of them since 1990, have been all up and down Puget Sound. So we've done projects in the San Juans, up in Skagit County and Snohomish quite a bit, we've done a couple in Willapa Bay and the Dungeon S. And so locally, some of the projects that you guys might recognize as Spencer Island, some of those initial breaches were paid for by a NACA uh, a bunch of the wetland work in French Creek, that area kind of between Monroe and Snohomish, that was a bunch of that was paid for through NACA. And then more recently, um, the Lekway Island restoration near Stanwood, the acquisition phase of that was paid for by NACA. Um, the NACAs I've been involved with since I started, which at Ducks Unlimited was 2011. 11? No, it was 2013, sorry. Um, this had just gone under contract. The schedule Lowlands, it was almost done, uh, but this was a bunch of acquisition work focused primarily on Barney Lake, which is just outside of the city of um, Mount Vernon. And we helped the land trust acquire some properties up there and we restored Trumpeter Creek with the county and with Department of Ecology and the land trust. Um, so you can see on the project, here's all the partners. It takes a ton of partners to put a NACA together. Uh, that's one of the requirements. They want a lot of different entities involved. Um, tracks are the different pieces of land. Um, sometimes a track will have kind of different project elements on it, but they generally are pieces of land. This is the acres, so 482 acres. The grant itself was a million dollars. And then the funky thing, with grants is you also have to have something called match. And match in this case has to be local or state money or private money that is contributing to the project that they can count as leverage for the project. So in this case, um, Department of Ecology money, uh, money from land trusts, they all came into this. Um, and so Ducks Unlimited really can't deliver a knockout on her. It takes a whole bunch of partners to put one of these together. And the types of projects we did on this um, included farmland acquisition, stream uh, naturalization, and then uh, riparian planting. So we're trying to go back to those land bird plans and shorebird plan and the waterfowl plan and maximize as many conservation values as we can on a single piece of property. And the questions in the NACA, like what, what species are you targeting? What uh, are they a priority? How are you addressing that? So these are pretty complicated grant programs and they take several years to deliver. There's lots of moving parts. The next one, and I helped write this one was the Central Puget. Um, this was primarily in King County. Um, and this was a project that really did a lot of cool things. Again, naturalizing stream channels. So taking a, an agricultural ditch and re-meandering it and making it look more like a stream so that it floods more often beneficially as opposed to uh, 
down cutting. So it's a really good salmon project on top of being a really good um, waterfowl project. We did something I call beaver food, where we planted a whole bunch of willows with the intent of beavers coming in. Um, and that shaded out reed canary grass. And if you guys don't know, reed canary grass is a major problem in our wetlands because it, it basically chokes out all the native wetland plants. And so we were trying to reset succession there with, uh, with trees and beavers and getting those wetlands working. And then there's acquisitions for pocket estuaries. So this was a pretty complicated project. It was a lot smaller. You can see it's uh, 476 acres. So the last two knockouts are getting kind of tiny in acres, but the, the grant and the amount of partners and the complexity of the projects continue to get bigger. Uh, the next one, which was the one I, I completely delivered for DU with all these different partners, um, was 13 tracks, almost 1,500 acres. And it had a lot of farm drainage. So a lot of projects that really concentrated on making farms act more like wetlands in the winter, but then make them more farmable in the summer. Um, so you can see we had four of those. And then we had some um, riparian restoration projects, some more of the beaver work. Um, we used Smith Island was the key to this one. So it uh, just outside of Everett, there was a giant tidal restoration that Snohomish County built. And we were able to use match in acres for Smith Island. We didn't contribute to that one. We used that almost entirely as match. So about $2 million of this project was Smith Island. And we were able to leverage that for, for all these other properties. And then the, the most current one, we just got this one, um, or we just got word that we got it. It's still not under contract, because we have a contract, uh, a knock in the Willapa and Chehalis uh, watersheds. And this is almost exclusively WDFW. So we're doing a lot of managed wetlands. We're doing some oak work. Um, so oak habitat that has wetland functions. Um, we're going to be restoring some tidal marsh. We're going to be uh, doing a whole bunch of work with spotted frog. And um, dusky Canada geese are really prevalent on a lot of these sites. So it's a bunch of acquisition that DFW was already getting, which is most of our match, and then um, enhancements on those properties. So those are kind of the big packages of NACA that, that we're trying to deliver with partners. And then if you want to drill down to one specific project, so go back to the um, Central Puget Lowlands project. Um, or not even Central, which is it. it's this one here. The North Puget NACA. Uh, this one is some Colony Springs. It's a managed farm drainage project. So what does that mean? Um, this is a picture of Snoqualmie Springs in this, in the growing season. I think this is about July, just before July, end of June. It's all corn for cows. This is silage corn. So when you have a dairy, you have all these surrounding farmland that, that basically grow corn. And that corn gets turned into more or less cow sauerkraut, um, silage. And then that's fed to the cows, they make milk, and, and the farms surrounding these properties uh, get nutrients from the dairy. So there's a balance there. This project, we were working with a whole bunch of different entities, primarily King County Conservation District, King County um, ADAP, which is the their basically ditch cleaning service. It's gotten so complicated in King County that the county takes over ditch cleaning and they also install hedgerows. The Snoqualmie Wildlife, uh, uh, Snoqualmie Valley Watershed Improvement District, which is a consortium, basically farmers uh, that have decided to get together and advocate for drainage and for water trading. Of course, Ducks Unlimited, we use sound salmon for a lot of muscle. Uh, they're a local regional fisheries enhancement group. And then the funding came from the county, King County, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So this is the farm. There's a complex 
I don't know if you guys can see the cursor, but there's a complex of buildings up here. Um, they grow silage in the, in these fields. And the big portion of this was cleaning the ditches so they work. Um, and then planting hedgerows around that to cool and clean the water, keep the sediment from the fields out of the ditches and also to provide some shade. Those are also really good tweed bird habitat. So you get a lot of a uh, lot of good hidey holes for uh, for small birds. And we planted species that would benefit those. Uh, the landowner was really interested in planting for for elk. So we picked a lot of our riparian species along the river to be friendly to elk. Um, we also used a variety of funding, so we didn't have to do the really wide buffers that ecology would require, which actually makes a ton of sense on the creek here because for the river here, um, just because of, of where it's at. There's also, this project got really complicated because King County has um, farm preservation easements on here, so anything that was planted comes out of farm production and affects affects their farm easement and they're not allowed to change more than 5% of the land to non-farm activities. Um, this site also has these water control structures that we put in, which allows the drainage to change throughout the year. So in the winter, you can stop the water and more or less flood these fields. And then in the, in the spring, you can control and uh, drain the field so that you can plant. And then you can add add some more control back to the water control structure, back the water up in the ground in the um, in the ground. So your groundwater table comes up a little bit and you can sub irrigate through the summer. So you actually instead of spraying the water on top of the field, the water comes from below because you've got that water table. Uh, this site's also really unique is some guy dug a water ski pond. Uh, a long time ago in order for him to practice water skiing. And so this can be used for irrigation storage. And it's, it turns out it's really, really good wood duck habitat. So the landowner there is really trying to maximize the wood duck habitat. And it's in a, in context of a whole bunch of other conservation projects that either Ducks Unlimited has been involved with, but mostly King County. So this is really a integration project where we're trying to help with different aspects of how to make the farm better for wildlife and still keep the farmer farm. So here's some pictures. Uh, this is the riparian zone. It's full of blackberries, uh, full of uh, deciduous trees that are dying. So we want to replace those with conifers. So we planted from about there, just in front of the bridge, all the way around the foot. And uh, this whole thing got planted with uh, big trees and we took out a whole bunch of blackberries. And that the muscle for that was sound the solution. So we paid for this with knockback with local money, the CWM, the Cooperative Watershed Management. Right. And then the drainage elements, we improved conveyance and in, in all kinds of ditches through the cleaning. So that was the ADAP program by the county. Um, we have about a 10 foot wide, 15 foot wide hedge of native trees and shrubs on both sides of all those ditches. Um, we repaired drain tiles. Uh, not everybody knows what a drain tile is, but a lot of farms have these pipes buried in the soil and they're perforated pipes and they take the water out and drain it. So without a water control structure, this is where the groundwater level is, right at the bottom of the pipe. But if we put blocks in that, uh, basically, they're boards that um, fit together. We can raise the water level table up and uh, hold water in the fields. And so we put three of those in there on their existing drain tile system. And why that's really important is something that's called the shoulder season. So if you are growing silage, you have a certain amount of time that it takes to grow that corn. And if the field is too wet, too late into the season, you can't fix it. There's no point in planting the corn, there's not enough time. Also, if it starts raining before you harvest um, and the field gets wet, you can't harvest that. So the shoulder season are those 
two or three weeks where it's just critical to get into plant and it's critical to get into harvest that you want the, the fields to be a little better drained than they, they can be the rest of the year. And then after the shoulder season, you can uh, keep those fields as wet as they need to be. And this site has been really, really good for birds. There's been lots and lots of birds using this plant. And this is a little bit more on what drainage water management is and what hedgerows eventually look like around ditches. So this is uh, the Whatcom County style of really dense hedges. And um, I've toured these a few times and it's amazing. You, you get ag ditches that have stream-like characteristics. They have gravels in uh, and they don't have to clean them out as often. But the cool thing is if you use the right kind of vegetation, you can actually mow those so you can get in to dig out the ditch and keep it clean, but then the plants pop back. So it's really a sustainable way to improve water quality and provide a lot of good habitat for a lot of little birds, especially. And then this is my little slide on, I won't belabor this, but this pond is going to be used to store water for water trading. Uh, this landowner had water rights. Um, and then also it's just kind of fun with the water ski. So that's, that's cool. And then this is kind of my vision board for what the landowner wanted. He, he bought this as an investment property for farming. He leases it to a dairy farmer. So he needs to make sure that he can grow corn. But he also is really into providing elk habitat and bear habitat. He hunts elk. Um, he takes about an animal a year, but there's half a dozen animals that use the site throughout the year and they hide. He loves his puddle ducks, his widgeons, and that's what most of the sites used for. Um, he's actively managing a whole bunch of wood duck boxes and he's made some really good wood duck habitat. And of course he loves his hunting dogs. So this, this site is providing lots of habitat benefits, but we're trying, but we, we needed to work with the landowner to make sure we're meeting his needs in, in order to work on this piece of property. And so again, here's, here's a picture of all those elements um, on the screen. And you can see that's, that is a Ducks Unlimited farm drainage project in our backyard. And that's that's typically what they look like. Uh, they're complicated. They're sort of little. This is only 150 acres, uh, but it's got a lot of moving parts and it's fulfilling a lot of needs for a lot of different interests. These are all the partners again. And then I did a couple slides of a recent project we did up in Samish, showing a different flavor of those uh, water control projects. And this one um, is a potato field, and we reestablished an agricultural ditch uh, in the potato fields. This was also with NOC, it's the same NOC grant. Um, and you can see we uh, held water in the field over the winter. So this is October, and then in January, you can see all the, you might not be able to see it, but there's just all kinds of birds using the site. And then when we drained it and the farmer put in a cover crop, that's what it looked like. It was pretty cool. At the end of this ditch, we captured all kinds of sediment. So all the sediment didn't end up in the surrounding ditches. It stayed out of the water. Um, so we ended up cleaning a whole bunch of water and keeping the sediment on the property. Um, you can see now that the uh, cover crops have been worked back into the field. Um, and then we were able to, or the farmer, because we didn't pay for this part, the farmer came back through, clean, clean the sediment out and worked that back into the field. So all that dirt that would have ended up in the, in the bay um, stayed on the site. And uh, so it's pretty good. And now this is going to be in pasture for a really long time. Past this excavator, we did what we call a farmable swale. So a really shallow 10 to 1 slope to bring the water to this um, drain. And in September, this is kind of what it looked like. You can't even really see it. It's in pasture grass. And there's the end of that ditch. And the water control structure is way off in the horizon. Um, but, but it's 
very subtle, but it conveys water throughout the site and provides some habitat diversity for the waterfowl and also makes it so this place is a little more harmful. So with that, I think that's the end of my formal presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions and talk about stuff. I don't know if that's the slide I want to keep up. It's a little blurry and kind of silly. Let's see, go back to the make everybody sick. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, CJ. Um, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to, to put them in the chat or um, if you want to, you can unmute yourself and, and say it out loud. Um, to get it started, I had just one quick question. Um, do you guys typically work with on, on larger scale projects or with individual landowners or, or kind of what's your usual size of project? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I came from the world of doing real small projects. I came from a little regional fisheries group. Um, so that was the thing that shocked me when I got to DU. We rarely work on properties that are less than a couple hundred acres. 32 people. Yeah, that's what, it's, or, yeah, that's what it says. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. Does anybody else have any uh, uh, questions for, for CJ? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, uh, I have a friend that works for King County and, they're, uh, and he's in the division that does uh, fisheries habitat restoration up in the same general area of the Snoqualmie that the Snoqualmie Springs area is. And I'm just curious how closely Ducks Unlimited works with the fisheries guys. Hmm. Good question. Yeah, well, most of our, we do some jujitsu with the money. So we are used to asking for money from salmon recovery folks. And so we work really closely implementing the salmon recovery plan. Um, and so I work with fish bios more than I work with bird bios, honestly. Um, so when we're working in King County on Snoqualmie Springs, we were trying to follow the Snohomish, what is it called? The Snohomish um, was a salmon recovery plan for the river. And so we were referencing that. So a lot of our projects directly address salmon recovery goals. Thank you very much. Uh, I see one question in the chat. It um, says, what efforts are made by uh, Ducks Unlimited to clean rivers and waterways of, of lead? That is a really good question. So uh, I guess the first thing is we supported um, lead-free shot way back. So that was the first thing. Ducks Unlimited has always support a steel shot and and, uh, and waterfowl friendly shot. That has four. Yep. Um, so the that's that's one, but to clean out the the systems of lead, that's a much more difficult question and it's kind of site by site. I haven't been on a site that's needed it um, or done a project on one yet, but we have, uh, I won't say worked, but Martha Jordan and I have spoken about that need and talked about how to fund projects that would actually go in because the the lead that's out there is usually from sinkers or it's from target shooting. And that is usually legacy and it's in systems that are often ponds. And and to get that lead out, it's it's basically digging up the lake bed and finding it all. Um, and it's a huge problem. So lots and lots of birds die because of uh, because of lead, and uh, it's not a simple simple solution. It's pretty hard. So I guess DU is not doing anything actively in the Snoqualmie except for policy. Um, but we wouldn't be opposed to a project that made sense for us to help with that. There's a few people in the chat saying thank you for the presentation. Does anybody else have any questions? Mm. Yeah, Alan. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, 
So I'm here in Edmonds with Edmonds Marsh Estuary. Uh, mm -hmm. Three weeks ago, Bonnie and I uh, counted must be over 200, maybe 300 uh, mallards and other ducks in there at uh, sunset. And I didn't realize how much that this system is used um, during mid midday, you know, obviously regular s small birds. Anyway, we're struggling to try and put together uh, a restoration situation for Edmonds Marsh. And um, I guess maybe some of our colleagues have been involved uh, with some of your organizations, but uh, I don't know. We're, how, how do we put together a, a, a package that uh, moves to a good restoration and also, how can we get some monitoring going on, uh, including for ducks? Yeah, monitoring is the hardest thing to get people to pay for. <laughs> um, when I first came on to DU in uh, 2012, 2013, I, I tried to get involved in the Edmonds Marsh restoration um, early. And we we put together a, a couple um, pre not presentations, but concepts to run in front of funders. Um, the woman I was working with left her position and the city sort of took that over. So I was under the impression the city was moving that forward, but if they're not, or if they want some help, I'd be happy to, to chat to see if there is a way for us to help move the Edmonds Marsh along. I think that's a great project and that's a really good site. Um, I know that's somewhat dependent on the stream restoration, and I don't know what the status of that is heading out to the south. Um, but I've heard really good things about the volunteers that have been working out there and battling all the invasive vegetation. I'd be happy to help if we could. Thank you. Any other questions for CJ? Not hearing any or seeing any in the chat. Um, this is Alan. Just want... oh. oh, I have another silly question. Yeah, go for it, Alan. Yeah. What, is anybody monitoring na native fishes in these new waterways? Um, I wonder if they're helping I'm thinking about beyond salmon and trout. I'm thinking of the, the smaller species of fish, the sculpins and the various species of minnows and other native species. Um, I would think that this would be expanding habitat for them as well. Yeah, so like the project that Ducks Unlimited really participated in for um, tidal marsh restoration, Lekway Island, uh, we were doing the engineering on that. Um, and post project, the the tribe, the Skilguamish tribe, if if you guys don't know where Lekway Island is, it's just outside Stanwood between Camino Island, and mainland, right there. It's the it's the land on either side of you as as you go over Camino. Um, I went out with the tribe, and when we monitored for salmon, we were looking for Chinook. That was the main reason we were out there, but we counted everything that we found. So starry flounder and sculpin and um, gosh, what else did we see? The starry flounder was really cool. I had never seen that many little little starry flounders before. Um, sticklebacks, which are kind of junky fish, but they're really good for heron. Um, so when they do monitoring of these really big projects, they tend to monitor everything. Um, the Monitoring in general is difficult and it has to be built into the initial grant. Getting follow on monitoring is much better. Our organization has found a way, or not us specifically, but you might have talked to Kyle last month. And he's He's got some really exciting bird monitoring going on. Um, but the tribes are, and DFW are doing most of the fish monitoring. I guess the county too, depending on which one you're in. Um, and so they are looking at that, but there's always more need for them. Thank you.
All right. Yeah, I just want to want to echo that. So thank you, CJ, for for uh, talking to us about what you and Dutch Unlimited does. And it's always nice to hear what some of these bigger organizations are are doing locally uh, to kind of understand where where they're at on the landscape. Um, and so appreciate some of the sharing you sharing some of the projects that you're doing um, here for us. And a number of people in the chat also said thank you and I appreciate your your presentation tonight. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thanks for having me. And you've got my contact information. If anybody wants to reach out, feel free. Yeah, yeah. If anybody has any questions for CJ that you think of later or, or projects you want to uh, ask them about, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in contact with them.